Okay, I'm assuming everybody can see my my screen now. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, I know that some of you may have dealt with some of these pests and some not. So um, we'll just start a discussion and hopefully learn from each other. So with um, uh, cutworms is our first little critter we want to talk about. And this is actually the most complicated of, of the three pests that we're talking about tonight, um, just because there's so many different kinds. So I'm just going to start off by saying first that cutworms, um, they're all larvae of, of species of noctuid moths. So the, those moths are kind of medium-sized moths. They're gray to brown um, with different markings. Um, cutworms can be subterranean. Um, there's certain ones that do their damage underground or climbing. They can actually climb up into fruit trees and, and cause quite a bit of damage. Um, if, the, if you find them in large numbers, then they're called army worms. Um, so some of the species that we see around here, and this is not a comprehensive list. These are just ones that, that um, uh, I thought were probably the most common. So um, the variegated cutworm, um, with this one, you can, um, you can tell this one by the spots along its back. There's, um, I think, seven of these yellow spots along the back. Um, with the black cutworm, um, this one has, it's typically gray to black with a, a tan stripe on its back. You can't really see it that well here. Um, there is a spotted cutworm, and even though it's called spotted, it has these kind of chevron marks along the side here. Um, the winter cutworm, this is actually a new invasive species in our area. It's been here for, um, I guess it was first seen in Oregon 10 years ago. Um, it may have showed up here about the same time. Um, and then the Bertha armyworm, that's the only specific armyworm I wanted to talk about just because that has been shown to be a problem in, in raspberries and other fruit. So each of these, um, each of uh, each of these is can be a problem in different crops. So the spotted cutworm, um, the Bertha armyworm, um, and the variegated cutworm. Oh no, actually, I have to look at my list here. The spotted cutworm, the Bertha, Bertha armyworm. Those are two of the biggest pests in in small fruit like raspberries and also orchards. Um, there's another. Um, common cutworm that I'm not showing here that can sometimes be a problem. Um, this winter cutworm um, is mostly a problem in turf or pastures. Um, I, this one is just, uh, if you ever run into an infestation, this is just incredible. Um, if you go out at night, the, the turf or pasture will just be covered in cutworms. I personally had this, um, this problem at my home in the lawn. And I literally could go out at night and scoop them up by the handful. Uh, my chickens were happy. And it's a good thing I didn't really care about my lawn. But if you had this in a pasture, that would be a, a problem. The variegated cutworm and the black cutworm um, are oftentimes problems with on vegetables. Um, and then there's also another one called the Western yellow stripe cutworm, which I didn't picture here that can sometimes be a problem in fruit. So there's a lot of wormy things out there. So how do you tell if it's a cutworm? Um, so generally, um, they, so down here, this is another thing you'll, you'll find in the soil. This is not a cutworm. It's actually a, um, people call it a, a leather jacket or a crane fly. Um, and you can tell it's a little bit different than these guys, sort of. But here's a schematic up here. You can tell this typical cutworm, they've got legs up front and they've got these pro legs in the back. And the pro legs are, are used for kind of sucking onto stems and inching up. Um, whereas this, uh, the crane fly, fly larva, even though you'll find it down in the soil as well, it doesn't have those pro legs or any legs at all. Um, and it has this kind of roughly hind end. So um, when you're digging down in the soil and it, it, you know, take a close look at what you have. The life cycle of the cutworm, um, oftentimes they have two generations per year. There's some that just have one. Um, 
they often overwinter as pupae. Um, this, this picture down in the left-hand corner, many of you will recognize that. Um, I know, you know, you find them when you're plowing or digging around, um, and that's all the pupae of, of cutworms look exactly the same, so you can't tell which one you have based on this. Um, so the adults emerge in May and June and lay eggs, and they hatch within a week and start feeding. Um, the, the eggs are actually laid on weeds, typically, or lower growing vegetation. Sometimes they'll climb up like this here. These are cutworm eggs that are laid on a bird mesh that somebody had put around um, their corn patch in the community garden. So they can lay them higher up, but typically they're low down in, in weeds um, and brush that's near the ground. Um, after they hatch out, you'll find them in groups. Um, and then just depending on what their, their um, kind of life history is, there's ones that, are, that climb and do most of their damage um, above the ground. And there's other ones that just hang out in the ground and come up at night and, and clip off seedlings. So if you see something like this group here, you might call them army worms. Um, cutworms, typically, you, you don't see them unless you go out at night because they're hiding in the soil. Um, I'm trying to think if I had any other notes on those. No. OK, so I, I just wanted to outline a couple um, general integrated pest management tools. Um, and this is just a list of what can be done. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a good conversation of what you actually do um, on your farm. Um, so the first part of integrated pest management is to know whether it's a problem. Um, a lot of people will find cutworms or their pupae in the soil and say, oh my gosh, oh no, this is horrible. But I always say, well, do you have any damage? And the answer is typically no. Um, so, so it depends. If you see damage, yes. If you just find them in your soil in small numbers, I wouldn't worry about them. Um, but um, even though they may, they have a they may not cause damage. When they do, it can be a huge problem. Um, I know they, they can cause huge amounts of damage in raspberry crops. Um, a, a friend of mine um, had the privilege of working with the Indo-Chinese Farming Association in, in King County years ago, and their cabbage crops were completely wiped out by cutworms. Um, they would cut open a cabbage and there would be like four of them eating it from the inside out. So, um, so these can be a big problem, but also they can just be part of the ecosystem. So for cultural solutions, we just suggest that you manage weeds and debris um, because the eggs are typically laid in weeds on the ground rather than on trees or higher up. Um, and then for debris, the cutworms love, you know, they need a place to hide during the day. So if you can get rid of the debris near your crops, um, that, that can be helpful. Um, when you're using a pesticide, these are the ones that, that um, are listed in the WSU um, Insect Management Handbook. Um, when you're looking into these, uh, it, it's gonna, it has to be registered for the crop that you're wanting to use it on. So these are just examples, and depending on what you're having trouble with, um, with cutworms, you would have to do some, some research. Um, the problem with cutworms is, is they spend most of the time underground, and when you have a pest that lives underground, they're usually particularly hard to manage. So, um, and this picture here that I just, I have to put one gross picture in every presentation, <laughs> and this is actually the, the winter cutworm that I mentioned um, that's invasive that can come in huge numbers into pastures and lawns, and um, this is one of the few instances where I actually, so this is dog vomit <laughs> because a homeowner, uh, you know, usually I would say, sorry, I don't deal with animals, but since I knew what it was, I, I said, okay, um, does your dog go out at night and eat things in the lawn? And they said, yes. So um, these um, can also be a problem with your pets snacking on them. So uh, chickens love them, dogs will you know, their tummies don't like them so much. Uh, 
So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Betsy or anybody else who wants to talk about what you do on your farm. Okay, I'll, I'll join in. I actually don't have a lot of problems with cutworms on my farm and it probably is because I try to keep uh, weeds under control, particularly um, with young plants, but a lot of uh, my fellow farmers in the area over the last couple of years seem to have had a lot of problems with uh, cut worms, basically things cut off near <laughs> close to the soil level and they were losing a lot of plants. Now we didn't, I didn't at the time look at the um, the site is their cover for cutworms, um, you know, the concept of disturbing the soil to uh, disturb the eggs of the, you know, earlier on before they all hatch out. Um, but we did talk about ways that people might be able to control them. Um, and one of the things that I use when we get to another pest, we'll talk about it, is beneficial nematodes. Uh, which are used on a lot of subterranean species. Um, basically, it's, uh, you know, if you saw the movie, The Alien, where people get infected and then all the bugs break out, um, that's kind of what beneficial nematodes do. <laughs> they get inside a pest insect mate and reproduce and explode out um, with more nematodes. So I use them quite a bit and it is listed, um, as a potential uh, control for cutworms. And the other one I was gonna um, bring up that is out is registered to use on cutworms is something called seduce, which is a bait form of spinosad that's used for other kinds of, for in this one particular one, uh, ants, earwigs, and cutworm bait, um, as well as it has a listing for now use in wireworms and maggots. So there are new things on the market all the time that might work better for one situation or another, but those are things that, you know, I've tried and other farmers have tried in the area. Um, that's, I'm glad you mentioned spinosad. Um, when I was looking up the recommendations, um, from WSU, Spinosad was listed um, for home use, but it wasn't listed in the farm section. So that's the only reason I left it out. It makes sense that that would work for this, yeah. uh, for cutworms, yeah. Um, and, and also with these recommendations I have here, some of these may not be practical for you, like cryolite is, is a, a clay. Um, it rains a lot here, so you'd have to reapply it a lot, but, um, Anyway, these are the options plus spinosad. And I was going to mention also, I forgot to put in there that with uh, subterranean pests, particularly large ones like this, sometimes tillage is really effective in reducing the populations in the soil. So it looks like we have another uh, a question from Ronnie actually about any other natural predators or non-chemical treatments that are organic that you would recommend. Ah, we didn't do the polls. Yeah, and in fact, I think that Ronnie's question actually brings that back up. So we could actually start with that poll first because that was one of the things we wanted to check in with this group about um, is your farming experience. Um, and so I'm gonna put up a quick poll first about farming experience and then whether or not you're organic um, versus conventional farming. So go ahead and leave this poll up here. If you wouldn't mind just clicking um, and describe your level of farming experience for us so that our presenters can gauge that as we continue on with this discussion. Yeah, so the, um, again, the beneficial nematodes are a good way. They are a natural product. You have to buy them from an insectary that raises them. And also you wanna make sure that you treat them carefully because they uh, can die. You have to apply them with certain regimes. So they're very sensitive to light. I usually apply them in the evening and when it's raining, ideally, so that they can get washed into the soil level. They're almost, they are microscopic and I do check viability under a dissecting scope to make sure that I have live nematodes and I'm not putting dead ones down because they all want the money and the time and I think they're working for me and they're all dead. Um, I also find working, uh, I like to get my nematodes from uh, an insectary that actually raises them buying them as opposed to buying them from uh, a, somebody who resells them because of that um, the issue around viability. 
Cool. So we've got um, just really quick the poll results. Looks like everybody's 10 years or under in their farming experience on the call today. So that's good for our presenters to know. And I'm going to also share our next poll, um, which is specifically just a question about whether you're farming organically or conventional or both. And so if you could just quickly take that poll, that'll also guide them in their discussion on um, potential management strategies that they can recommend. And while we're doing that, um, I don't know, Betsy, if you already answered Tammy's question. Yeah, but I, yeah I'm typing it in here. Oh, there you go. Biology. I gotta remember where they are <laughs> on the East Coast. Okay. I just I just wanted to mention we we um, <laughs> um, all the um, the recommendations that I'm listing are okay for organic use. Perfect. Okay. Right. So we're got we're gonna go ahead and share the results of that one just for the presenters to be aware of. So it looks like the majority is are farming organic with some conventional and other in there. So. We'll go ahead and move forward with our discussion. So does anybody have additional questions for our presenters or you want to jump in and chat about what you've been seeing in your fields with cutworm? I'm sorry, I just joined Jess. Um, it's Dana. Yeah, um, thanks for joining us. Okay, so I missed kind of what uh, has been said so far, but yeah. Are we just doing questions mm -hmm. for the? Yeah. yeah. So we're going That's through right. each section talking about each individual pest and then we're opening it up for QA. So right now we're just finishing up cutworms. Okay. Tell us your experience, Dana, with cutworms. Yeah. Yeah. I've had lots of cutworms. And I, so I had a lot of problems with cutworms under remays on my brassicas. So I stopped putting remay on, but then I'm having you know, massive death from root maggot. So I feel like I can't win on the, especially broccoli front. Um, so I'll jump in, Dana, have you tried um, beneficial nematodes? On the broccoli, no. Okay. I, I, sprayed, um, I sprayed a spinosad, um, when I planted them and some like BT thinking like if the cutworms ate one plant, then maybe they would die before they ate a second one. So you might want to try um, beneficial nematodes, which will work subterraneally on the, um, the cutworms, which spend most of their time under the earth, especially during the day. And as far as spinosad, there is a spinosad bait. So in other words, it's put in a bait form. Oh. And that's the one um, that I found out about through John and Heather and through the folks on a horse drawn farm because of wire worms, but it's actually listed for hmm. use with, um, with cut worms. I have, this is the, it's certified organic um, and it comes in a 50 pound sack. So you might figure out a way to split the cost. Yeah. <laughs> But anyhow, that's something that has potentially has some use for other pests besides cutworms and right. bring it up. That might that might help as well to to deal with your problem. And then the other thing that we, we talked about, what Laurel brought up, is uh, tillage around the plants because it disrupts both the the young uh, larval stage a little bit more in eggs that are laid around there. So mm -hmm. and keeping vegetation kind of cleared near those young plants. Yeah, I mean, we're cultivating with the horse between the road, between the beds. Yeah, so all that helps. And I, I think when, when I was mentioning tillage, I think um, with the cutworms, oftentimes they curl right up at the base of the plant. And so yeah. it's going to be the tillage um, before you plant um, mm -hmm. that would kill some of those, the larger cutworms. And, mm -hmm. keep them, you know, or, and or bring them to the surface for animals to get. But if you've got a big problem, then it may not be enough. Um, well, yeah, last year it was so bad under, like with my remay on that I just didn't remay any of my brassicas this year except the turnips. And, 
but then I'm losing, you know, almost equal numbers to grasp a root maggot as I would have to cut worm. So, yeah. Do you, um, on your farm, do you have enough space to, to rotate and just put those crops oh, in it? They're only there. Uh, everything's rotated on a four year rotation. Okay. Yeah. Cause I have, I have, uh, like Betsy, I have, um, club root, so I can't go any sooner than that. Okay. That's for right. a future discussion, club root. That's a big No, I just, I just zeroed in on that. I'm really curious how common that's getting around here. Um, Cause that's a really important one to talk about. I think most of us have it at this point. <laughs> okay, good to know. <laughs> um, and, and for um, folks that have alternative or conventional farming methods, if you need um, other options that, that follow the methods that you're using, I'm happy to talk to you later and or um, on the resource sheet that we um, are going to give out, send to you after this, um, there is a, a, a link to the WSU uh, pest management page where those recommendations are. Perfect. So is there anybody else I know that it, um, I think we've been keeping track in the chat. Um, is there anybody else who wants to jump in and chat about cutworms before we move on to the next pest? Burning questions. I, I have cutworms in my greenhouse where I can't till, you know, so I'm wondering like, or like, uh, I have a tilly, you know what that is, or I'm thinking about a tilter. Are those like enough disturbance, you think, to help? Mm. I'm actually not familiar with that, so I, I couldn't, I, I don't, I can't comment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how big is your greenhouse? Um, I mean, I have one that's like 90 by 30 and then a couple that are 40 by 20, I think. Okay. But the doors, yeah. It just doesn't work to get a tiller in there. So okay. a tiller is like a small electric rototiller. So it would work like any other gas, like like that you can drive rototiller. Yeah. The, I, the only reason I was asking about the size is that um, I know we've got smaller farmers on and this would be more appropriate for them, but... Um, but cutworms, since they come out at night, if you if you got some kids or some adventurous uh, employees, um, you could just do a sweep after dark and try to catch them while they're out, and that will disrupt the next generations. Um, but that's you know that's labor intensive, of course. So I did a lot of that in the fall, actually, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's dark early. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it looks like Amy has a question. Amy? Yeah, um, I was wondering um, when you showed a picture of the pupa in the soil and you said all cutworms typically look like that. Um, are there other beneficial critters that have that same? Yeah, on the bottom left. Because I've definitely seen that. And your first question was, um, is it a problem? And no, it's not a problem yet. But I'm just wondering if there, if I squish them, if I'm squishing potential any other good things. Um, yeah, there's, there's many, many noctuid moths in our, you know, around. Um, and so there's always the potential that it could be one that's not harmful, but, um, but, you know, if, if it, if it's your livelihood, I would go ahead and squish it. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm usually the first to say, if it's not a problem, don't squish it. But, um, but when you're dealing with your livelihood and if, you, particularly if you see a lot of these, um, I would squish them. If you just see one every now and then, it's just not probably not going to be a problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'm curious for those of you who do have cutworm problems, I would love to see pictures of uh, which ones you have. I'm happy to come out to your farm and take pictures myself. I'm just kind of um, curious. The information I'm providing is based on information that I've gotten from other WSU researchers and farmers. And I'd like to start learning more about what species we're actually seeing out here. So, I mean, these, these ones I presented are very likely to be the ones you have, but I'm just curious since we're, you know, we're our own unique little, little corner of the world. Awesome, thank you, Laurel. 
Is there anybody else that wants to jump in? Because if not, we're going to move on to the next pest to try to keep us moving forward in the discussion. And again, just a reminder for those that came on after um, we started the introduction, we will have time at the very end. Laurel and Betsy are going to stay on until um, probably around eight o'clock to have some extra discussion time for those that want to stay on. So we'll move on to cabbage maggots. Okay. And I, um, I just wanted to put in a, a few words too. Um, Betsy was saying beforehand, and I agree with this, um, the more we know about what pests you're really struggling with, the more we can we can direct research and resources um, to this area. It's just that right now, um, at least, you know, the the WAC researchers and and other folks tend to, you know, they're in in Skagit and other larger farming areas. And so, the more we know about what you're dealing with, the more we can bring to you. So, um, okay, cabbage maggots. Um, <laughs> Uh, for those of you that have them or have them with cutworms. Mm. Okay, so cabbage maggots um, go after just about every brassica. Um, you can often uh, identify, you know, see that you first have a problem because you see that that your broccoli or cabbage or, or what are your, or your, um, or your radishes are stunted or they're wilting for no other reason. Um, of course, if you have club root, that could also be <laughs> your culprit, but anytime you see mysterious wilting, um, it's good to pull up uh, one of those plants and see what's going on there. Um, so, okay. So the cabbage maggot life cycle, they typically have um, at least two generations. They may have three. Um, these are a fly. They're um, about half the size of a house fly. Um, and they they lay their eggs right at the base of the plant, or or at the edge of, or in a crack in the soil near the base of the plant. Um, when those eggs eggs hatch out, they burrow into the crown of the plant. Um, and once they're done eating eating up your livelihood, then they just drop out of the roots and pupate in the soil. So these little pupa here are quite small. They're about a quarter of an inch long. Um, you guys are probably familiar with these. This is this is the maggot. Um, if you were here for the the cutworm portion of this, I pointed out the difference between a cutworm and a a, a crane fly larvae. Um, well, the crane fly is also a fly. So um, with this larvae, you can see it doesn't have any legs or pro legs. And then if you would look closely at the hind end, it kind of has the ruffle on the back, and that's really common with with um, fly larvae or maggots. Um, so the hard, the difficult thing about the, the cabbage maggot is once it gets underground, there's very little that you can do about it. Um, and so what you want to do is keep it out in the first place. Um, so, um, actually, so with, with this, with the integrated pest management, you can target the adults by keeping them away from your brassicas, um, and the larvae and the pupa. Actually, I don't know why I put the larvae and the pupa in there. <laughs> you want to target the adults and keep them out. So um, a big one for this is is um, rotating crops. Um, you know, if you've had a problem before, don't put brassicas there. The next year, um, you can use row cover. But the key to this is is um, if we go back to the life cycle. Um, once they're they're done with their second generation, or sometimes their third, if they can do a third one, the pupa sit in the soil all winter, and so they're ready to hatch out into adults uh, first thing in the spring. So if you put in your brassica crop, you put a row cover over it, and you've already got the pupa in the soil, they're just going to hatch out under the row cover and have a nice protected environment to get into your crop again. So um, rotating and row cover, those are the two key, key um, preventative tools. Um, you can also use uh, transplants. Um, the larger plants are more likely to have energy to outgrow the damage. You know, they may not, but they are going to be much more resistant. Um, an interesting one I read about is using drag chains when you seed. Um, apparently, the um, the the adults are attracted to the moisture gradient um, in the process of seeding. So if you attach drag chains behind your cedar, your, your cedar, 
then um, that evens out the moisture gradient and the adult flies aren't attracted to that. Um, and then of course, monitor your seedlings. Um, as soon as you see wilting and stunted plants, if they're not gonna grow and produce for you, you might as well get rid of them and destroy them. Um, and then another really important thing is disking under your crop residue. Um, if you're leaving brassicas in the ground that are that are infected with root maggots, it's just, you know, it's going to just perpetuate the life cycle. Um, these do have natural enemies, but in a farm situation, the natural enemies um, aren't going to be numerous enough to to do significant to help you significantly. But rove beetles and parasitoid wasps are both your friends. Um, I listed the pesticide as a dacrin here, but I put it in parentheses because it it's um, these are it's it's recommended but not for very many crops across the board in the in the pest management handbook. And the reason that is is it's very, very hard to control pests that are that spend their whole life cycle under the ground. So um, so prevention is is your best your best bet. Let's see. Okay, I've got to unmute. All right. I have dealt with um, root maggots for probably 25, 30 years now. Um, I've tried a lot of things from the old little home remedies like wood ash, diatomaceous earth, making little collars out of tar paper. I would go around and look under each plant and look for the little tiny little white eggs and re disturb them. Um, and I've done things like hilling up because after there is some damage, uh, a lot of the brassicas, if you hill up, will reroot in there. Um, and I've also done beneficial nematodes. And I actually got more into nematodes because of onion maggots. I have the lucky fortune of somehow I got onion maggots. Maybe it was from some transplants I bought, whatever. And in an effort to deal with that organically, um, I did some research and this is probably almost 25 years ago. And I thought, well, I had read that these were being used for uh, brassica maggots. And because they're both a very tiny fly, even though each is specific to its host, um, that why couldn't I use it? So I contacted an, an, an um, nematode insectary and had a lot of discussions with the scientists there. And they said that nobody had ever used um, beneficial nematodes on onions. I said, well, can I just try it? Because you recommend it for brassica. So I started buying them and I also had brassicas and I started trying that as well on both the onions and the brassicas. Um, as what's true of a lot of times when you're using these kind of natural predators, that's it, not a hundred percent. So you'll have them effective because there's so much variability in the soil. And again, if you haven't checked to make sure that your nematodes are viable, if you don't put them on when the conditions are right, in other words, um, you have to have moisture on the ground, you have to, you can't let them be exposed to um, sunlight, they have to be washed in, the soil temperatures have to be right, they don't work when the soil temperatures are cold. Um, but all those variables can affect how well they work. And I found it was useful when um, for maggot control in general, especially if you have a large population of um, maggots and flies that are laying eggs all over your stuff, to do it more than one application. That kind of helps to even out if you didn't quite get it right the first time or your batch wasn't as good. And I've had reasonable good control on brassicas without reme. I still lose one or two here and there, but fairly good control. I didn't have a big crop loss. Um, and uh, But I also have done reme as well, which is sort of great because I don't have uh, cutworms right now. And that keeps everything really looking clean for the early season stuff. Um, I found that uh, root maggots on brassicas are worse. It seems like the worst um, in April and May, that's when it's bad. And it seems like after that, I can do brassicas without having to do any kind of um, row cover or nematode treatment without worrying about them too much. It seems like that worst population, and I've talked to farmer Brian of Butler Green Farm and he said the same thing. It's that early season stuff gets hit 
um, the overwintering ones emerge and they go after your transplants. Um, so those are the ones you got to kind of watch it. That's been my experience. Great. Does anybody else, I know that we have a question about how do you recommend destroying infected crops? I don't know if Betsy or Laurel, you want to chime in on that question? Um, I guess if you could chop them up and compost would be the best. I don't say that I always do that. I kind of put them in a big pile and uh, just because I don't have that capacity to run everything through, but I pull out, try to pull out the old, um, you know, crowns of the brassica plants because they're kind of woody and they're a problem when you try to incorporate them in. So pulling them out and away from the fields and putting them in your compost pile is at least getting them out of there. I mean, true, the flies can fly back in, um, which is another thing, you know, who, but who's in the soil, who stays in the field could theoretically become a, um, a host for another generation to increase the overall population. So. It's just something you gotta be mindful about and try to find a way to deal with crop residue. I don't say I'm, I'm totally effective, but I don't have, I'm not doing masses of brassicas at the moment, so. But my neighbor farmer has a lot of brassicas and he tends to throw it into a, he makes a big compost pile. Yeah, I was gonna say crop residue, particularly when you have a lot of it is, is tough, but I think bringing those roots to the surface um, it's really going to matter what larval stage um, the root maggots are at. If they're too young and, and the roots desiccate above ground, they're not going to be able to mature and pupate. But if they're almost to the pupating level, they're just going to fall out of the roots and mm -hmm. uh, into the soil and pupate. So um, do the best you can. And I also read that even though there's multiple generations of these, that the later generations in this area don't do as well because it's drier out. Um, and those, they kind of dehydrate, which is sort of explains why the first generation is usually the worst. Um, that kind of into, like I would see the tumbleweed cabbages um, in May. And it seemed like they loved cauliflower flower more than almost anything. But everybody just, you know, and then they just fall off <laughs> in a big windstorm, <laughs> roll away. <'Cause> <laughs> <laughs> I love that tumbleweed cabbages. I've yeah. never heard that before, but <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool name, bad problem. Um, yeah, I was gonna say with, with the, the next pest we were gonna talk about, the um, the carrot rust fly, it's the same thing. The early the early generation is the worst one. But um, before we jump to that one, we should, are there any other questions? Don't be shy. This is your time to talk with the farmers and the experts, so. Um... If you have a question now, feel free to ask it. Otherwise we can move on and you can hold it till the end and we'll have more discussion. And everybody probably is thinking the same thing. So they would really be happy if you- Right. You know. <laughs> it looks like Megan's asking another question. If we're seeing cabbage maggot on some crops now, would it help to cover other crops at this point with row cover? Brassicas, other brassicas? It sounds like if you're seeing it on other crops, yeah, around I'm assuming, it's, I'm assuming brassicas. Again, we're almost at the end of May. So this is where I start to not worry too much about it. Again, you can, if you cultivate, when you're cultivating, if you ever do any hand weeding around the plants, that's a great time to just, um, as I said in the past, I used to just go around and stir up the soil right around that um, stem where and because that's where they lay the eggs you can push the dirt away and you see these little white things like little tiny white right miniature rice grains those are the eggs and so disturbing them and pushing them away is a great way to but again it's that April and May it's like April they're laying their little eggs everywhere in May they're also laying their eggs and doing their damage and by the time I get to June I in this area I stop worrying about it So I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think it's going to be a big problem unless you have very young transplants. Because they can, if you hill, remember I talked about, you can just hill up 
And I know a lot of growers, big growers will do that too. They'll have, they'll run through their big fields with the hilling discs and they hill up onto the stems with dirt. And if the plants have at least, again, the maggots don't eat all the way through all the time. So they can send new roots out into that, into that dirt. So that's what I would do now. Yeah, and um, and Betsy, I'm glad you mentioned the the various collars. Um, I I left those out because I wasn't sure. I <laughs> I usually talk about those for home gardeners, and I yeah. and I didn't <laughs> I um I, I didn't know what size farms we were gonna I have. Tried, I tried everything at first, yeah. but like you know, <laughs> it was kind of ludicrous, but you know. I mean, yeah, that's. I, I tried diatomaceous earth. I put that all around there, wood ash, and I was experimenting. But yeah. that was a long time ago. I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, sometimes all you can do is experiment and you'll find what works for you. Um, yeah. You want to move on to carrot rust fly? Yep. Okay. Um, so, carrot rust fly, um, I understand it's becoming more of a problem around here. Um, it can infect carrots, parsnips, turnips, parsley, celery, celerac, and related weeds. The related weeds is, is kind of a, a big thing. Um, again, this is another fly. So you'll see these maggoty things that don't have any, any um, feet or pro legs. Um, they have a very similar um, pupa. It's about a quarter of an inch. Um, and it's kind of a pretty fly, but, but we don't like them anyway. Um, okay, so the, the maggots will overwinter in un, unharvested hosts, um, uh, or the, the larvae will, or the pupa will, will overwinter in the soil. Um, they have three, um, three generations around here. Um, there's the, the mid-April to June, the adults emerge then, uh, mid-July, and then late September and mid-October. Um, and yeah, this is much quicker than cutworms. You, we did the, the big one first. So, <laughs> okay, so for the integrated pest management tools, um, the rotating crops, um, they're listed as weak flyers in, if, you, if you read the literature, but then if you, if you um, read um, small print, uh, they consider weak flyers to fly um, about a thousand yards, which on a small farm, that's the whole farm. So, um, so I don't know if weak flyers really matters for, for um, farmers out here, because we're pretty small. Um, don't overwinter susceptible crops. Um, a lot of people, um, I don't know so much about farmers, but sometimes folks will leave the carrots in the ground and harvest them later because it's a great way to store them, but that can perpetuate your problem. Um, if you manage weeds related to carrots, um, like Queen Anne's lace, like poison hemlock, um, anything that's in the carrot family, if it's in your the edges of your field, that can perpetuate the problem. In fact, one, one farm that I worked on, they found that their carrot rust fly problem was mostly just on the edges of their field, um, most likely because it's coming in from the weeds. Um, also coal pile, piles, when you're harvesting and leaving the, the rejects out in the field, those can be a source of, of overwintering or carrying over the population. Um, row cover is one of your, your best friends for this. Um, again, it's the same thing. Um, if you've had carrots there before, don't put carrots there again and put row cover over it because the, the pupa are already in the soil. So um, row cover can keep them out, but it can also keep them in if they're already there. Um, one, one thing that, that people do around here is, is delay planting. So um, if you can miss that first generation of the carrot rust fly and plant in late May or early June, um, what happens is if you, you have that first generation, if that goes strong, that influences the next two generations throughout the summer. So a lot of folks have, have luck just planting a little bit later to, to not encourage that first generation. Um, early harvest, that, that's just referring to, you know, don't store your carrots in the ground for later. Um, and then uh, deep plowing in fall or spring is also recommended. Um, there is some degree day modeling, um, which I think we may get to in a different dirt 
uh, Dirt Talk. I'm not, I, I'm more familiar with the degree day modeling for orchard crops and pests. So, um, but I was reading recently that there's there's information out there to, to predict when the carrot rust flies will be flying. Um, there are no pesticides that are recommended, at least not organic pesticides, because again, this is a, a pest that spends its life underground. So, okay, Betsy. Okay, um, I don't do masses of carrots, but um, I do do some. I have had a little success with that late uh, planting before, um, and but I, the most success I've had, especially as a small grower, is Rime, and I've talked to other farmers in this area who have success with carrots and they just say spend their whole life under Rime as soon as they germinate get the Rime on um you got to take it off to weed once in a while but and hopefully the fly doesn't fly in so that's the first thing and then you move the location on a small farm like ours it's or most of the people here it's hard to find an area that you can rotate i think nash i talked to the folks at nash's and they do a lot of carrots and they like huge big fields way far away and they find i go what do you guys do it for he said well we always lose um carrots along the perimeter because they'll they'll hit all the carrots on the perimeter so that's sort of like the trap crop but in the middle of the field it works now none of us have um, fields quite as big as Nash's. Um, so I think the best solution that I've found and that I think other growers um, in this area is to use row covers. Um, and it works. It's kind of a pain. But then when, but once you're harvesting, I don't worry about it anymore. Then just take it off and, you know, you're not going to really get too much damage by the time um, you get the rest of the field covered. I know I left some carrots in over winter and they were all fine until I started seeing a little bit of damage later on. But then I, this year I planted them in a different location and they're under remade. Does anybody have any stories they wanna share with their experience with carrot rust fly? Or any questions you have? I have a question. Um, we had a weird thing last year, and um, it was not carrot rust fly, but it was related to carrots. Um, that both Robin and I and Tara and Marty at Broken Ground all had this thing where we planted carrots, and this happened to me three different um, I want you to, I want you to read just this a minute one. um and then which one is that these just a minute I'm talking and then um covered them saw them germinate covered them with reme and then took off the reme to do the first weeding and and they had been flame weeded also like before they were germinated flame weeded germinated uh -huh. covered and then, what? Uh, what? And then we Wait. took the remay off to do I, the first weeding, need... and there weren't any carrots anymore. They were gone. Huh. And that happened three different plantings for me, and it happened read. multiple times to Robin, and it happened you to Tara Mighty. There were so like a bunch of us had no something. carrots at the market Mom, last year. So I have, and I really don't know what it was. Something. Hmm. Laurel, do you have any idea on what that might be? It's obviously sounds like another potential insect pest that might have done it. Or how could you, any trapping systems that you can think of that could have been used um, in the situation to see if you could trap what the pest might be? Yeah, you, you mentioned you had cutworms and the cutworms can definitely go after carrots. Um, so that would be something to investigate. Um, I don't know if you have bull problems. Um, no. This is like, these are like tiny, like yeah. I'm saying like took the reme off, the seedlings would have been, you know, between one and two inches tall, no yeah. carrot underneath. Yeah. And the one thing that I didn't know whether it was related was both Robin and I saw springtails in our field and didn't know if those like, like we tried to look it up and it seemed like they, weren't probably doing the damage uh but we both saw them 
Yeah, no, spring, spring tails, I, I don't think I've ever seen those do crop damage. They, they're really common in, in uh, soil with high organic matter, um, particularly if it's damp. But um, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of stumped, but I can ask around to um, other uh, WSU folks and see if they've experienced what you're describing. Um, I mean, it could be some fi some violets. Is that what you're talking about? Because they can also go after carrots. Mm. Yeah, especially if a high organic matter. Yeah, our, our organic matter has. I just got my soil tested and is pretty high now. Um, on the you know low to high scale, it's on the high end. Uh, so it may be. That we have some phylums. I haven't seen them. Yeah. But it's helpful. Yeah. If you um if you think you might have some phylums, well, typically when we see some phylum damage, it's it's um it wouldn't be your whole entire field that would, unless you just have an astronomical problem, usually it's kind of patchy. Um, but if you wanted to test and see if you have some phylums, um I don't know if you've heard of the cut potato test where you just cut potatoes in half, you kind of sink them into the soil and you ha you'll have to cover it with a pot because you want to keep it moist and leave that there for a couple of days and then you know come back and you just flip over the potatoes and if you see the little white symphylons running across, then that's a good indicator. Um, I, can, I would have to look up the threshold levels to um, what is considered damaging levels. I, it, I just can't remember what the number is. It was a, it was a very strange thing because the carrots yeah. were in like, I mean, my farm's only five acres, but they were not close to each other, the different beds that were damaged. Um, yeah. They weren't near each other and, the, and it was like almost complete, mm, like, wow. like, there was a bed of carrots and then there was nothing like maybe five percent or less were left huh and you didn't see you didn't see any carnage it was just gone no just gone huh. it was very strange and it, i i mean i would have like said oh i must be mistaken and they weren't really out but it happened three times in a row <laughs> um i can't remember if you said three times in different spots at the same time or you re replanted and it happened again three times? It happened like at three separate plantings in three separate places at three separate times. It seemed to be between, it seemed to be mostly in the months of April, May, and June. Okay. The, the plantings of April, May, and June all died. The March planting, did like two thirds of it stayed and the July planting for the fall was all fine. No problem with the July planting. Okay. Okay, I'm just gonna ask around and see if- Cool. We're all stumped, the, those of us who had this issue last year, so. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Yeah. I'll ask around because I'm stumped also. So to be um, cognizant of our time, it's 730 now. And uh, like I said, Betsy and Laurel are going to be staying on for a little bit longer for those folks who want to chat and discuss um, these pests or other pests. If you just have questions for them, it's a great time to kind of do some networking and chat with them about that. Um, so they'll be on for another about half hour for those of you who want to stay on. And so um, those of you who are not interested, thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to try to make this a three-part series. Um, so be looking for an announcement. We're going to shoot for end of June, potentially for the next one. We're going to send out, um, Laurel's posted this um, resource page here. We'll be sending that out along with a quick eval to the folks that are on the call tonight. Um, part of that eval will be asking um, what pests you're seeing or want to discuss, pests you're having issues with that you want to discuss on the next session. So please take that 
Betsy's raising her hand. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure it's on the resource list, but this book, which is Diseases and Pests of Vegetable Crops in Canada. I know it's Canada, but it's close, you know. Um, I bought a copy of this about 20 years ago, and I find it invaluable because of the co amazing color plates. It has on all kinds of nasty stuff that can get on your vegetables, as well as life cycle information and cultural stuff. Ignore any of the chemical controls that are in here, but the life cycle information um, and other kinds of cultural things have been really useful for me as a farmer. And I found that this is now available for free. This cost me like 150 bucks 20 some years ago, but it's available for free, an online version um, if you click on the, in the resource link. So a really nice tool, if you don't mind looking up stuff online and you don't wanna deal with a big heavy book. Uh, so put that in your toolkit. Yeah, for sure. And we'll have links to all of these handbooks and additional um, resources that we will send out. So, um, so yeah, I want to thank you guys all for joining us and please, please take that eval when we do send it, because that will help inform us what the next session, um, which pests we will be discussing. We'll be basing it on what your guys' needs are. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to open it up now to just general Q and A and discussion with Betsy and Laurel, for those of you who do want to stay on and chat. I, I accidentally closed my presentation, but I just wanted to to point out a couple of things on the resource list. Um, on the on the list that Jess is going to send you, we'll actually have the websites. I just um, forgot on some of these. So um, so this this um, this one from Canada is excellent, free on the web. Also, the Pacific Northwest Management Handbooks. Those are um, there's one for disease management, pest management, and weeds. Um, typically, they contain um, information for um, both organic and conventional growers that's specific to Oregon and Washington. And they, they, they're updated, if it's not every year, it's every two years. So um, those are, are useful and they're online. Um, I just had a couple other things that I, that I uh, thought were particularly useful resources that you might find helpful. Um, there's a publication on winter cutworms um, that uh, a friend of mine published down in Oregon, and it and um, it had an interesting comparison chart just showing different pictures of different cutworms, but it describes the problem of these cutworms. Like I mentioned, they're mostly kind of grass and pastures, but they have been known in other areas to get beets and, and other things like that. So they could be causing trouble for vegetables. Um, we just haven't seen it yet. Um, this um, WSU tree fruit website, um, they have descriptions of some of the, the, um, the cutworms that I talked about and also some other cutworms and armyworms that I didn't talk about. Um, and they have much more specific information for um, fruit and, and tree, well, tree fruit and cane fruit. Um, or I guess they say just tree fruit, but they may have a little bit of cane fruit stuff. Um, I also came across this, that one of the best descriptions about the carrot, carrot rust fly also comes out of Oregon State University. And I was intrigued, um, Betsy mentioned that Nash is kind of considered the ends of their rows, the trap crop. And there's actually a mention in this article that, that I cited here um, that some farmers were trying to, you know, they, they plant some carrots in a field where they had carrots last year um, as a trap crop, and then they would destroy it to keep them away from their new carrot field. Um, there isn't, according to the article, there isn't research on that yet, but um, anyway, it, this article had some of the more innovative um, information on the carrot rust fly. I'm going to do a little quick plug for what I think why I'm so excited about this program and I hope everybody who's listening will take note this to me this is an example about what cooperative extension which is it's a program in every state in the country um, has an outreach program to work um, with a land grant university in our state is Washington State University and what's happening out in the field and so what these extension specialists are doing is they're connecting with us as growers this is what they're here they have that their whole purpose of being is to help all of us. So I hope you all will see this as an opportunity 
to learn for what you know to share what you need help with and so that they can help provide that and we all are sh learning together on this so i'm pretty excited about it um and i'm proud of our team here in kitsap county for um doing this outreach to help us and um i hope everybody will keep participating in these programs and that we can expand them yeah Thanks. Thanks, Betsy. I agree. And I, I wanted to let you know that it, now that I'm actually officially on the WSU integrated case management team, part of my job is to actually, if you want somebody to come out to your farm and look at a pest problem or a disease problem you're having, I'm happy to do that. Um, I, what, what I'll do is, you know, I, I have certain um, expertise, but I know what my limits are and I will connect you with the WSU experts that have the good stuff. <laughs> so um, so if you just want somebody to come out and take a look at, at, at what you have, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and we'll get that conversation going with, with other you know, researchers at the Mount Vernon Research Station and other locations and try to get you a, a good answer for your problem. Yes, thanks, Laurel, for bringing that up. I was going to let people know um, we're super lucky to have you on our regional small farms team now and being able to provide this service to farmers. So um, please take advantage. Um, her information is on our regional smart, small farms website under the contacts for our team. Um, and then it'll also be on that resource list as well for you guys um, for future purposes. And it looks like Ronnie has a question. Ronnie, do you want to chime in? I don't know if you're on your phone or your computer. Yeah, I'm looking at it. There's some small bugs. It's really, it'd be nice to be able to see the small bugs so that, we, you know, we could, uh, I'm sure Laurel could identify them um, under a, a microscope to find out what they are. So big key of control is understanding what is your pest to begin with. Um, you got to know what it is. And then also the other question she probably would have is, um, are they, causing any damage. There's a lot of things out there. There's a lot of things living on us that's not really causing damage. So we don't try and kill them all off. And so the same with uh, things that in our fields, it may not be a problem, but part of to figure that out is to see what is it. And, I, and you have to identify it first. Everyone should invest in a microscope. Just tell well, them. They're, they're visible. They're, um, you know, like half the size of a sesame seed. So they're small, okay. they're, they seem to be perfectly round and they do damage the stem. Okay. Um, you know, when you wash them off, there's obviously a small cut where they've been sucking out fluid. Um, and the same thing with the dahlias. Uh, my mother-in-law just told me to keep rinsing them off. I got um, ladybugs in hope that they would eat them, but they didn't. So I didn't think that they were an aphid, but maybe they were just kind they don't like. They're very hard, which I was surprised. I tried to squish one and it was really hard, but maybe that was because it was super small though too, that you just can't physically squish it unless you were to use your fingernails. So I just, if you knew, then that would be cool. But um. no. Yeah, it, it's, um, it would be awesome if you could get a picture and send it to me. I just put my email address in the chat box um, just because I they, I could guess, but I want to make sure I <laughs> get, get it right. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. I will do that. Yep. Thanks. Pictures are great. Um, and again, if I, if I can't figure out what it is, um, I can also come out to your farm and get a sample and there's other entomologists that I can send things to. So mm -hmm. um, there was there was a question in the chat box. Carrots. Yes. Forked carrots. What are the causes of forked carrot? For it are, is that only caused by carrot root knot nematode or any other cause? Um, what first I'd ask what are, what's the soil conditions like? that can sometimes soil conditions can cause forking. Yeah. Well, we grow a lot of carrots. This was my question. We've grown a lot of carrots very successfully. And then all of a sudden we had two beds planted side by side. It was like midsummer when we were harvesting and there was like a tremendous amount of forking uh, mm. that I had never seen before. 
And then it didn't happen in our next planting at all. Our soil is super sandy. So uh, I don't think it's the soil. Yeah, I was going to say with root knot nematode, um, typically um, the other symptoms of that are having um, a lot of extra root hairs on it. And mm -hmm. sometimes you'll even see bumps. Um, so if, if they're just forked and there's not extra or enlarged root hairs, then I wouldn't. I wouldn't say nematodes. Oh, they were pretty hairy. Yeah. Oh, well, they were pretty hairy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, forked and hairy. That all sounds well. Yeah, that all sounds right. Yeah. Okay. Forked and hairy. That that sounds like nematodes. But if you <laughs> if it happens again, you can always pull one up and and we can um, send it to Jenny Glass. I I'm not um, I'm not sure if I have a strong enough microscope to look at that, but we can we can investigate further. But if they were forked and hairy, then nematodes are a good bet. Looks like Tammy has a question. Tammy, I don't know if you can unmute and- I can, yeah, sorry. Uh, so I don't know if the screenshot is gonna go through. It's this little tiny worm I've seen forever, and it, I think it's everywhere. It seems really a, like a good thing. Um, do, can you see it? Um, I'm just trying to download it right now. Yeah, well, it's, it's only a screenshot. It shouldn't be a large file. Um, yeah. Let me see. I could okay. share a screen, but. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and share your screen. I do that. I, I hold on my, okay. My computer is. Uh, currently dying and uh, yeah so hang on okay and so wait so no I need you back Crap. hang on all right hang on I gotta back up I'm so sorry so I share screen how I uh, share screen mm -hmm. and so um what do I choose whiteboard or um, you should be able to choose whatever um, you have up. So it, it should be your online. If you're it's online. you, but let's see. You have to have there. it all open on your computer. Got it. How about that? Yep. Got it. Ew. Um, and they're all over. They're little, like they're kind of silvery and they're always kind of curled around and they're really sweet. Yeah. yeah. But they're teeny tiny. Okay, so so these are these are millipedes. Um, are you are you having any damage from them? No. Okay, I, I only ask that because typically um, millipedes they are detritivores, and so they are eating rotting vegetation typically. But oh. um, recently, um, there have been a couple farms who 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 use no-till methods who are reporting that these are actually causing significant damage on their seedlings. I'm not sure, actually, I shouldn't say these ones in particular. Um, the, a sample of them has been sent to a millipede expert in Virginia. <laughs> so we'll, we'll um, Jess, Jess and Kelly and I were joking about um, uh, millipede gonads because um, Jenny Glass, who actually fielded that question, she was trying to identify them and didn't, didn't have I yeah couldn't see their gonads close enough to know which species they were, but um, that was more information than you ever wanted to know. But typically millipedes are they're great they're, they're just decomposers. Um, but hopefully so, we'll yeah go ahead. Can, uh, can I ask? All right, I got it. And so they sound fine. This is an area that is tilled because I'm very very small farmer. But in my apple orchard one day. I found a green, and I know I have a photograph of it somewhere. I just can't find it right now. It's very frustrating. But a green worm about an inch long with horns. It seemed like it was a one of those tomato um, evil things. Oh. But, but it was an, an apple orchard. Yeah. Um, I was just, I, <laughs> I just happened to be, hold on, let's see. I'm going to share my screen. Thank you. Um, is that the little critter? Um, 
maybe it was bright, bright green and it had a little red in it. As I recall, I may be wrong. Um, yeah. I, would I will find the photograph and I'll send it to you. Okay. Okay. In general, if you just see one of something, I just, I wouldn't be worried. I, I just happened to, when I was, um, um, kind of perusing the literature on cutworms, I just happened to come across this. I've never actually seen one, but, um, but these can be a, a, a problem in orchards. Um, oh. yeah, I'm just actually, I, before I say that, I guess I didn't read further on this because I wasn't going to include it, but, um, I just, before I say that, I want to make sure it's not only a problem on the east side. We can find out more, but, um, but yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of larvae and other critters that just will never be a problem for you. Um, so if you start seeing damage, that's when I'd start worrying, but, but we can look at this one just for interest. Yeah, no, and it was it was very beautiful. It's actually very, very pretty. So I um I let it go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good good for the ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah. Um okay, let's see. Um any recommendations on Millipede because I'm just reading the chat box. Um Yeah, we're uh, so the recommendations for millipede control. We're we're kind of waiting till we, um, till we hear back from this millipede expert. With millipedes, you know, just reducing the amount of organic matter is is kind of a, a good thing to do. But you can't do that if if you're no till a high organic system. So this is kind of a new problem for us, and um, hopefully we'll be able to find out more soon. So. Um, so Kayla, what farm, Kayla, are you from? Um, okay. Wild Tower Farm. Wild Tower Farm? Yeah. I, I'm just writing it down because there's another, um, Jess, there's another farm that's having the same problem. So it's just interesting. It's interesting to me to see how widespread it is so we can um, you know, the more information we have, the more we can do about it. Um, yeah, and uh, the the one farmer that's been having a lot of problem recently with this um, that spurred this conversation is um, doing what Betsy said. She's kind of attacking it in, in a lot of different ways in her own way to just test out things because um, like Laurel said, there's not really um, a whole lot you can do in a no-till system. So she's um, testing that out now. So it would be interesting to kind of put minds together on that once we hear back from the specialist. Um, and it looks like JW, no microphone, but has a question about growing red currants. Mm -hmm. And has been warned that there's a worm particularly interested in these. Is it one of the ones discussed this evening? Uh, nope. <laughs> there's there's two there's two worm pests that I know that go after currants um and there could be more these are just the two that I that I know of and and that are found around here um the first one I'll mention is the um the uh current current sawfly and that is a, a pest of the foliage um strangely it's it's actually a fly that has the larvae have legs and you'll know that you get that because it will just completely defoliate your plants um so, but that it's not gonna, you know, not gonna kill them. Um, the other one is, um, there is a current maggot um, and that one will actually get in your fruit. Um, and that is a big problem because your customers won't like that. Um, there's, a, there's a current maggot that will get in the fruit. And then there's also the spotted wing Drosophila, which is the, um, the fruit fly that's getting in all the soft fruits around here. So. Um, so those are three things to look up. Um, yeah. I see Renee smiling. She probably has some experience. Yeah. Anybody want to pipe up about those? <laughs> we don't grow a lot of currants, but we have like enough to harvest and sell. And we haven't, we have raspberries in the spotted wing Drosophila. Mostly just loves raspberries. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of fruit. That's where we see it. The most is in cane fruit. 
uh, but I was just thinking, like, I didn't even know to worry about current maggot. <laughs> but I'll look it up. You're going to yeah, say, well, high protein fruit. Okay. Yeah, yeah all those seeds. It's in a there. marketing problem. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've had mites. Is it mites on the leaves of my currants that make the current, the leaves sort of shrivel and turn red? That's been something that I've actually seen on my currants before. Okay. Yeah. Um, the um, I may I may not have the name right for the the current maggot, but um, I can if other people have questions, I can look it up really quickly so you have the right name to look up. I've never seen it myself. I know other people who have had trouble with it. Okay. Does anybody else have questions or comments or stories to share? about your pests. <laughs> well, I could say one thing is we have a huge amount of spotted wing Drosophila, the fly, and our raspberries. And I hear other people say it's in their blackberries now, even blackberries, but it's all over our raspberries. Is there any way to um, curtail that. Let me see. Sorry. Um, I just want to show you. So it's the, the current and gooseberry fruit fly. Mix. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so it, you can, oops, sorry. I'm, I keep forgetting I'm on my laptop. So. <laughs> Um, so this is the this is the Pacific Northwest um, Insect Management Handbook, and so you can find the entry here and um, read more about it. Um, you can keep it out with a floating row cover if that's practical for your farm farm size. Um, and then they also list. Let's just see. You, you'll see on here these they have um, conventional and um, organic. Um, uh, options here. So anyway, you can read more about the, the, um, the current fruit, fruit fly on there. Um, for spotted wing Drosophila, um, anybody else, anybody want to chime in on that? I'm just going to say I don't have a current update for that, but I'm happy to do some research because it is a huge problem. Um, and when that showed up in our area, um, you know, we were particularly worried because it can just hop from one soft fruit to the next, to the next, to the next, you know, starting with strawberries and going all the way through the fall with all the soft fruits that we grow around here. Um, not to mention we have wild, um, wild and invasive blackberries that it can, it can um, multiply in as well. But um, I don't have an update on that. So I'll just leave it there. That would be probably something, maybe a future talk on that one. There's quite a lot of um, work that's being done because it is such a problem. And there's some new ways that people are trying to come up with stuff. So that might be a talk onto itself at some point. Um, it's a game changer for a lot of fruit growing for sure. Yeah, um, we could probably see if we can get a, a specialist to come in and talk about it because it's so big. Um, but yeah, um, put that on the list. Anybody else have comments, questions? Now is a great time. We've got five more minutes with these ladies. If not, like we said, Laurel's going to be available to you, you all now. Um, given for Clallam, Jefferson, and Kitsap, she's going to be your go-to person for technical assistance on this stuff. And she will be on our website. And we will go ahead and send out her information to you all as well. In case you have questions specific, she's happy to chat with you via email and phone. And I'm just going to put it out there because she already said it. Um, I was hesitant to do it until she said it, but she will also make appointments to come out to your farm and 
and go through your fields with you if you need that service. So um, we're super lucky to have Laurel here and we're super lucky to have Betsy sharing her expertise and her background with all of these pest issues as well. And I know Betsy is always open to helping farmers um, that reach out to her. And um, I just feel like we have a great group of individuals in our corner of the woods here to help you guys out. So please take advantage of them um, if you need them. And with that, I think, um, yeah, everybody's saying thank you guys. And with that, I think we'll just say good night and please be on the lookout for the email. It'll have that email in it. Please fill that out. That'll help us in our future sessions um, for what pests we're gonna be discussing and um, just give all the feedback that you can. And we appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Thanks everybody for being